Good evening, everybody. Welcome to We Make Milton Visionary. My name is Nancy Reed. I am a junior policy planner with the town of Milton. I'm also the We Make Milton project manager. And first, before you go, before you go, <laughs> come back. Let's have a huge round of applause for the Milton Concert Show Band. I would also like to say that um, there is going to be a Christmas concert on December 7th at the First Presbyterian at 7 p.m. So if you want to know more of this, um, tickets can be purchased and please check that out. So I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. Um, this, is a, this is a very important event. This is a very special event. We are here to talk about a uh, vision for Milton to the year 2050. And that seems like a long time away. And we all have children in our lives and um, people who are going to be here in 200, uh, 2050. And so that is a reminder that that's why we're here tonight and to talk about how to make Milton the best place possible. I have a few housekeeping items. First off, please, in respect for our speaker and for everyone who's put effort into this night, please turn off your cell phones. Emergency exits, please exit out of the front doors. Please congregate in the parking lot. Washrooms can be found just across the hall. Take, your, uh, take care of yourself. If you need to use the washroom, please leave and do that. And I would like to ask Barb Koopmans, who is the Commissioner of Planning and Development, to introduce our speaker tonight, who we're very excited and happy to have. Thank you, Barb. Thank you, Nancy. Good evening, everyone. My name is Barb Koopmans, and I'm the Commissioner of Planning and Development at the Town of Milton. On behalf of the Town of Milton and our dedicated staff team, I want to welcome you all to the We Make Milton Visioning Night. We are so thrilled to see all of you here tonight. It's great to have the community come together to talk about the future of Milton. The We Make Milton Project is an innovative engagement initiative that the town staff created to inspire and motivate the community to get involved and help us to develop a new official plan. I'm sure most of you have seen and heard of the Milton family here behind me and their friends. These characters have been created based on local demographics and interests to inspire the community to share input and stay involved in the We Make Milton project from start to finish. Everyone here is a stakeholder. You just may not know it yet. Milton is a proud and actively engaged community. Over the past few months, the We Make Milton project team has been listening to the community's thoughts and concerns and learning about values. We've received over 1,000 comments during the first phase of public engagement. Please congratulate yourself, that's tremendous input. The new official plan's modern land use vision and framework will be crafted locally in partnership with the community. Tonight's event kicks off We Make Milton's next phase of engagement, the visioning phase. Visioning night has been designed to open conversation and inspire visionary thinking about Milton's future. Our goal for the evening is to get your input to help us set Milton's vision. An official plan is a forward-looking document that describes the community's long-term vision. It sets out goals and policies to direct land use and manage development. Milton's current official plan is based on a, vi uh, on a vision that is now dated. So it's time to set a new vision that first reflects current ideas and priorities for the future of Milton, that promotes a strong sense of community, that supports sustainable growth, and finally, that realizes our potential as a place of possibility. 
Creating a modern community vision is an important step in the official plan review process. All of the policies in the new official plan will align with this vision. The word happy has come up over and over again in our engagement so far. It's important that our policies foster a sense of community. Well-being is at the core of our planning practices. To get us started tonight, our guest speaker, Charles Montgomery, is going to talk to us about the relationship between town design and hum human well-being. Charles is an award-winning urbanist and the author of Happy City. He explores the link between the ways we design our cities and the ways we think, feel, and act. His work demonstrates how each of us can change our own lives by changing our relationship with the cities we inhabit. Charles has advised and lectured planners, students, and decision makers across the US and Canada, as well as internationally. His writings on urban planning, psychology, culture, and history have appeared in magazines and journals on three continents. So thank you all for coming out tonight and joining the conversation. Let's all put our hands together to welcome Charles Montgomery to the town of Milton. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say uh, how grateful I am to be able to uh, speak and, and share ideas on, on lands that have been uh, occupied traditionally for thousands of years by uh, various uh, overlapping First Nations. And also to be invited to speak with all of you who are, have uh, uh, built a very special place together, but now you're looking towards the future to imagine what that future will look like here. And I want to suggest to you that um, you have an opportunity to actually nurture your own happiness and your community's happiness and resilience as you build that place together. Now, um, I'd love to show you some pictures here. Great. Uh, so, what I typically do when I'm working with communities around the world uh, is I try to share with them evidence on that connection between community and town design and human well-being. You know, my frustration is that so often that evidence, you know, I'm a total nerd. I like to go to libraries and look at boring reports. They sit up on the stacks. But the problem is most of that evidence sits on the stacks at libraries. Planners don't read it. Politicians don't read it, except for your mayor, of course. Um, and the people who shape cities and design cities around the world don't read it. And I've realized that you actually need to feel the science as much as you need to read it. So on that note, I was going to ask if all of you would participate with me in a very brief experiment. It's going to take about 30 seconds. Uh, I'm going to give you instructions for that experiment now. Don't do anything yet until I finish my instructions and I'll say go. Um, but first I would like to know um, who would not like to participate in this experiment. Please put up your hands and we'll all look at you now. Great. I actually can't see anybody with these lights on, so I'm assuming you're all in. Okay, here's how it's going to go. Uh, can we bring the lights up, please? Not on my face, but on the audience. Uh, here's how it's going to go. Ah, there you are. Beautiful people of Milton. So, when I say go, I want you to stand up if you're able. And if you're not able, stay there and wave, and, and somebody will come to you. I want you to identify somebody you don't know, a stranger, hopefully somebody who's not like you. So no going to your friends or, and, or your fellow counselors, Mr. Mayor, all right? I want you to pretend, go to that person, so maybe somebody in the row behind you, go to that person, and now you have to pretend that you're old friends and you haven't seen each other in 10 years. What would you do? What would you say? Would you take a selfie together? Would you hug each other? Would you give each other high fives? You're only going to get 30 seconds, so I need you to move quickly and I need you to get into it, okay? So introduce yourself. Pretend you're old friends. Buddy, I haven't seen you forever. And then get into it, and I will cut you off after 30 seconds. So move quickly. So up, please, if you can. And groups of three are fine, so nobody's left out. Ready? Go. Always kissing babies. 
right. Okay, stop. Stop it. Stop having fun. Stop. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, stop kissing babies. Sit down, please. Well, first of all, I want, I want to thank you for participating in that experiment. And now I want to do a, uh, a quick check-in with you. So if, ever, any, who, if you feel worse now than you did a minute ago, let me hear you just say worse. Hmm. Who said that? If you feel about the same, uh, say, meh. Right? Okay. You're, that's okay. If you feel better than you did a minute ago, say better. Oh, okay. So uh, what this means is that all of you are, are pretty pretty normal, actually, uh, including uh, the one person who didn't, who felt worse but didn't want to say so. Uh, what we know is that every time we have a brief trust-building encounter, even with a stranger, it makes us feel good. It makes us feel happier. And the question, one question is, you know, why? Why would that make you feel happier? Well, one reason for that is this molecule. This molecule is oxytocin. Oxytocin uh, is the best friend of anybody who's given birth. So any mothers out there, you love oxytocin because as your baby is screaming and crying and everybody else wants to run away, you still feel that kind of warm and fuzzy feeling. So oxytocin is released at birth. But oxytocin is good for the rest of us too. We all get a quick hit of it. Every time we have a trust-building encounter, it makes us feel warmer, it makes us feel happier, and it's an inducement to act in a trusting way again. But something else happened to all of us in that moment. And I don't want to share that with you yet. You're going to have to wait for that. Before I do explain to you the, the dynamism in that moment and the, and the kind of a, um, the, a synergy that happened, I want to tell you why I came here and what brought me to this moment with you. So backing right off again. Uh, so... Uh, I'm Charles, as you heard before, and I spent 10 years working on this book called Happy City. By the way, if you want to be poor, just do that. Um, so parents tell your kids, if you're going to be a writer, you get a parallel career, like a dancer or something. Um, but anyway, during this time, what I learned was uh, that indeed, our cities, they change the way we feel, they change the way we move, and they change the way we treat other people in ways most of us don't even imagine. So I believe we have a responsibility to fix the mistakes we've made over the last 70 years in city building, but also to consider when we're making new places to infuse them with designs and systems and moments that boost human happiness, because we can. So the first question you need to ask uh, when you uh, are someone like me pitching happiness is, well, wh what do I mean by happiness? If I want you to design for happiness or build happier town, what does that look like? What are the ingredients? And that's a tough question. We've been arguing about this for thousands of years, actually. But then something happened about um, 300 years ago in the Enlightenment in Western Europe. Uh, they put their best scholars to the task. Why does this guy always come up when I talk about happiness? Um, well, they failed. They tried to measure pleasure and pain within the, the human body, and they, they just couldn't do it. So that's when the economist stepped forward, there he is now, um, Adam Smith and his friends, to say, don't worry, we've got this. You can't measure pleasure or pain, so let's find a proxy for it, another measure. Let's just watch how people spend their money, and that will tell us what makes them happy or not. And everybody thought, yeah, not a bad idea. Uh, so then gross domestic product or economic, ac economic activity, it became um, a proxy for happiness. The bigger the economy, the happier we all are. So now we're in a, a bit of a bizarre situation where tsunamis, earthquakes, divorce, cancer, all these things supposedly make us happier because they generate economic activity. So some of us have begun to think, well, maybe we need some other measures of societal well-being beyond GDP. GDP matters, but maybe some other things matter as well. So uh, fortunately, over the past couple of decades, actual scientists, sorry economists, if there are any in the room, have been studying the link between the human body, our mind, our environment, societal systems, and well-being, and finding signs within the human body. So I want to let you know the, the disciplines my team and I are drawing from when we come up with our recipe for happy communities. So we're drawing from public health. We're drawing from psychology, from neuroscience from behavioral economics, from sociology, and other disciplines. And, and by that I mean, you know, even 
uh, we're learning from property developers. If they study the results of the places they, they build, if they study how those places make people feel after they build them. So we put all this, poured it into a recipe for urban well-being, I'll call it. And we think it's a very robust recipe, and you'll be happy to know I'm not going to share the whole thing with you tonight because that would be an eight-hour presentation and be kind of dull. And there's a great book that describes it all. So instead, that was kind of a joke, you know, pre-Christmas. Anyway, so instead, I uh, want to talk to you about what matters most of all, the ingredient that matters most for urban happiness. And for that, I feel like I should introduce you to uh, someone who I think is a global expert on this theme, on what matters most for urban happiness. There she is. She's sitting in the middle of this picture. It's my mother. This is uh, mom's 88th birthday. And uh, her neighbors put on a tea party for her. But um, if you look closely, you can see they weren't drinking tea at all, which is part of her, her secret to longevity. Uh, but why do I think this woman is such an expert on happiness? Well, she's an expert because she's deeply connected to her family, her friends, and her community. And this is what's keeping her alive. She's in everybody's business. You can't get away from her. So we know that people who are socially connected, they are reporting higher happiness, but they're also reporting more productivity at work. They're less likely to get sick. They're more likely to survive cancer. They have more resilient communities, and they live on average 15 years longer than people who are socially disconnected. So nothing matters more. Uh, now, most of us would say, well, yes, I know my relationship with my family, my friends really matters. But the lesson from the science is that your relationship with everybody else in the community matters as well. So at the University of British Columbia, Elizabeth Dunn uh, went around and she gave her students uh, beepers and they counted the number of superficial interactions people had through the course of the day. And then they asked them at the end of the day how happy they were. And what they found was remarkable. The more interactions people had, the happier they were. Even introverts reported being happier at the end of the day when they bumped into more people in a positive way. So there's my mother again at the farmer's market and she never buys anything, but for some reason they love her there because she's always yammering away at people. So incredibly popular. And so this market is actually a device for my mother's health and well-being. So this plays out across Canadian uh, cities. So looking at big Canadian cities, I think it's useful. Um, uh, looking at the correlation between self-reported life satisfaction on the, top, um, on the top grid and trust in neighbors at, on the bottom grid. And what you're seeing here is this really strong linkage. C places where people uh, report higher trust in neighbors are much happier. Now, if you're reading some of the uh, names up here, here we have uh, big, rich, Vancouver, Toronto, Calgary, and we are looking at metro areas there, so I think you fall out of the big Toronto downer zone. Uh, you're falling outside of that zone, lucky for you. And who's winning? You know, humble St. John. So my socialist friends on, on the left coast will say, hey, see, this means money doesn't matter. Well, they're actually wrong. Money does matter, but the social effect completely overwhelms the financial effect. Being rich is pointless unless you have those powerful social connections. And for those of, those of you who are jumping through here, um, uh, our, our cold, hard eco economists and GDP worshippers, just know that for the sake of your local economy and the national economy, you know, nothing beats strong social trust. Nations with strong trust do better, so do cities with strong trust. And I just wanted to point out here that in, indeed, um, this is becoming a national and a global crisis, a crisis of isolation and loneliness. It hits the elderly hardest, it hits young people second hardest, and it hits newcomers to communities third hardest. And it's becoming um, a massive health, health risk, and we need to deal with that. Find ways to include everybody in our communities. Okay. So I hope you'll, bear, you'll um, agree with me that social trust, our relationships with each other really matter for the well-being of a community. Um, so how does this, how does this shape, shape out? I mean, I know you're thinking today about, well, how are we going to shape our community in the future? How will we make it grow? How will we design that growth? Well, what I found it was, was remarkable, actually that you can predict all kinds of things about people's well-being just based on the kind of neighborhood they live in. So I want to show you two different um, urban and social systems. On the left, we have uh, what's called really dispersal. So this is a completely auto-dependent, uh, single-use community. 
uh, which may look familiar to, to some of you. On the community on the right, we see a mixed-use, connected street grid. You could live your whole life in that picture and get everything done and never need to leave that street grid. Shops, services, stores, schools, um, uh, transit, because it's dense enough for transit. So let's compare those two different systems. Uh, okay, system on the right, residents are emitting half the greenhouse gas emissions. We've entered the era of climate crisis. The planet is burning. This is serious. And if you don't care at all about that issue, that's absolutely fine, because the things you would do to make your community happier also happen to tackle this, this issue. So what, happen, what else happens on the community on the right? People are, uh, households are spending half as much money just getting around, because they don't need that second or third car. So let's add that up. If you have a second car, or in this region, a third car, that extra car over 35 years is going to cost you about 570,000 in RRSPs. So let's th th think about how this happens, uh, how this plays out locally. Um, this is very crude, looking at uh, your city's data, uh, sorry, your town's data, and I kind of highlighted the walkable zone right down there in the middle around uh, the traditional Main Street. It's my, actually much, much smaller. So Ward 2, which, which crosses over that area, there's about uh, 0.69 cars per member of every household. Uh, looking at Ward 3, out uh, more into the hinterland, which is w less walkable, you're looking at 20% you know, more car space per household member. Uh, the point is, the, the, the less walkable the neighborhood, the more car you need, and the more it's going to cost your family. So there go your retirement savings, there go your kids' education. You can start adding these things up. So the costs really do matter. Um, another system effects is, just by living in the more walkable place where you can reach things by foot, uh, you're likely to weigh 10 pounds less because over in this community, it's just impossible to walk anywhere useful. Uh, what's interesting to me is um, uh, at one point in my life, my uh, parents moved me to, to a cul-de-sac uh, far away from everything because they said it was much safer for me. What they didn't know is that the evidence is now showing us that uh, I, if I stayed there, I'd live three to five years um, a shorter life because I would be more prone to diseases of sedentary living. So moving to the walkable place is a health intervention for your, ki for your kids. But the focus of my talk tonight was really about social relationships and social trust. What people are reporting, now a lot of my data comes from large uh, American, um, uh, American metropolitan areas. So comparing cores, including um, suburban town cores, uh, with, with edge communities and the dispersed communities. Uh, what people are reporting in those places is that those who live in the walkable zones where they can get their needs met in a five-minute walk or a short bike ride, they are reporting being more likely to trust their neighbors, more likely to know their neighbors, more likely to have their neighbors over for dinner, more likely to volunteer, more likely to vote, play team sports, because they have the time. They're not spending their days driving across the miles. So we also see, are starting to see a really strong correlation between divorce rates and the length of people's commutes, or the, the length of time they're spending in their cars. So uh, we know those more uh, walkable, connected places are good for health, good for happiness, good for the budget. So essentially, I, I see your challenge here is how, with the hundreds of thousands of people moving to this region, how are you going to ensure that you build less of this on the left-hand side putting more and more people, hundreds of thousands of people, dependent on your road system, frustrating them, but also those of you who are already using those roads, and build more of these connected places that all of you can connect to easily while still living in the, um, in the communities you love and enjoy, but giving more people a chance to live in those dense or connected places that give you opportunities. So I think uh, that would be uh, a priority for most healthy cities. And the cool thing is, in looking at um, your future urban structure scenarios, I'm already seeing that. You're identifying these places where you think, okay, here's a node, here's a node, here's a node. And if we connect these nodes, we can offer everybody a healthier, more connected, happier, uh, more resilient life. So yay, it's a great beginning. And I know you're gonna be flushing through that. So um, I, I really appreciated this image from your, um, uh, from your future, future scenario around the GO train station. Now the question is then, okay, if, you, if you're setting your sights on building more walkable, connected places, um, what can we learn from the science about how to make those places work well for everybody? So uh, 
And I, I would say also how to make them wonderful. So lots of people want to live in those places as well. Uh, because you're really going to be in competition with other, other cities. And you're going to be in competition with the edge of other cities. You want to draw people to those, to those walkable places. How do make, we make them wonderful? Uh, I want to share some insights from his, uh, some experiments that my team and I have done uh, around the world. Uh, a few years ago, we collaborated with the Guggenheim Museum in New York City. And I was very interested in how street edges made people feel. So we worked with a, a neuroscientist from the University of Waterloo named Colin Ellard. Oh, funny story. Uh, Colin wrote a book about wayfinding in cities, and the Canadian title was Where Am I? But it also has a, an American title. Can anybody guess the American title? I can't hear you. Pretty good. Pretty close. You are here. Right, so we, we are slightly culturally different from the Americans. So uh, we worked to understand the effect that sidewalks and buildings had in these neighborhoods. And we used this incredibly futuristic Canadian technology known as the Blackberry. And uh, yeah, sad about that. Anyway, um, uh, Colin hacked the Blackberries to take a subjective uh, reading. How stressed are you? How happy are you? We also used skin conductance monitors to measure people's level of, of stress in the moment. Uh, and then we sent, uh, sent out walking tours. We learned lots of interesting things, but I'm just wanting to share one with you, and that's this. People were much happier along this street edge. Jumbled up, gritty, tenement street edge than they were here alongside this award-winning mixed-use building. Now, we all know we want to be building more mixed-use in our cities, and this is supposed to be a wonderful building. Why weren't people happy here? Well, first of all, we know that people walk faster alongside a building like this, which has a long blank edge, translucent glass. You can't get in and, in and out along the block. We also know that older adults get older and die more quickly when they live in neighborhoods that feature this kind of architecture because there are fewer places for them to walk to. But something else was going on there. We think that despite the grittiness and the dirtiness, this environment slowed people down because there was more to do, more people to see. Shops, services, little stores, little bars. People like that, and they slowed down, and it was the slowing down that seemed to make them happier. Well, after having conducted this experiment, I thought, well, geez, I wonder if these places change people's behavior. I wonder if these places change the way we treat complete strangers. So we tested this out, this theory out, in, um, in a neighborhood outside of Seattle. And we enlisted a bunch of volunteers, and their job was to just look like stupid lost tourists looking at their map, completely lost, kind of like me when I go to New York City or, or one of those big scary places like Toronto. And um, so just kind of look helpless. And then we surveyed street edges for active edges. Again, a very gritty place, this. Active edges, by which means small shops and services. And then blank edges. And we watched to see how people treated our lost tourists. So there she is. So how, how did these places change the way she was treated? Well, the effect was really remarkable. Uh, on the active edge, small shops and services, people were four times as likely to stop and say, hey, do you need some help? And then when our volunteer said, well, can I borrow your cell phone? They were absolutely more likely to lend her their phone. And then when our volunteer said, oh, you know, I'm just so hopeless. Can you just take me where I need to go? It's about 10 blocks away. Uh, they were four times as likely to actually go out of their way and, and guide this person to, uh, to their destination. And actually, that volunteer managed to get a date out of the experience, which uh, is very bad research methodology. But they're probably married now. So um, what we learned is that uh, these slower places nurture kinder, more pro-social behavior. So... Well, then I was wandering through Windsor uh, a few months uh, ago, and I'm like, wow, Windsor spends all this money on this giant new casino to fix the town, and it kills, blocks the street edge. Went over, I think this is Ford City in Windsor, or over on the right, they already have a wonderful example to learn from of a warm, um, inviting, human-scale street edge. I mean, there's science at work right there, even when they didn't even know it. We know uh, also from research by Lawrence Frank at the UBC that surface parking, when people are ex exposed to surface parking in front of uh, businesses, they say they feel less sense of community. They don't bump into people they know or people they like. So we know that's a big deal because 
the sense of belonging and connection really matters because people return to places they love. You need people to love uh, your high streets, your main streets, and your businesses if you want them to return. So, okay, how does that translate then? Well, we know in Milton you're going from, uh, in your central areas, particularly around the GO station, you're going from the surface parking environment. You're going to transform that. And uh, one place I really love, which was, I think, uh, the um, east end of Main Street, is you're already doing that at a very nice human scale. Now, this was early in the morning. There was nobody there. But it was wonderful to see these small shops and services. I would venture to say that this environment is not just going to nurture more walking behavior. It's not just going to be safer for women walking um, at times of the day where there aren't many people there. But it's also going to be a kinder and more, uh, more friendly environment. So way to go. Um, okay, here's my favorite street. This is Commercial Drive in Vancouver, one of the greatest streets in the world, almost as nice as your traditional Main Street. How did it get this way? Well, let's just zoom out and uh, take a look at the map. Well, this is Google Earth, uh, Commercial Drive. You see those buildings pushed to the street edge, almost like Commercial Drive is a living room. It's wonderful. But another thing is happening here. Those, bu those uh, buildings are not required to provide parking. So it means the buildings are very resilient. Rent is cheaper, and they are able to adjust in times of economic change and take on new tenants and whatnot. Well, guess what? Under new parking re regulations in most Canadian cities, maybe here, here's what this street would look like. Businesses are required to provide a ton of parking, and they're not even allowed to share parking, and they're not even allowed to spill over parking onto neighboring streets. I know parking's a big issue, but this would effectively kill the most wonderful street in, in my city. So what do we do about parking as we're moving towards uh, a car-reduced economy? But you're not there yet. Uh, one thing you need to do is just provide parking garages. Uh, too often that happens right out on the street. These are parking garages in Boulder, Colorado, and what they've done successfully is get the parking off the street, hide it upstairs so you can maintain that street edge that nurtures social connections. And this is a street that where the businesses will retain customers, footfall, return traffic, so it'll feel wonderful but be more resilient in the long run. So parking. Um, I was told today that you are uh, creating a new town square outside your town hall. And I think that is so important. Your community needs places to gather, to feel at home, to feel that sense of belonging, and to connect with one another. And uh, you're so fortunate to have that fine-grained fabric along your main street. And I just thought, well, I thought it might be useful to put in a, a slide to inspire you what not to do. So down in Dallas, they figured, we have such a spectacular new city hall, well, this was back in the 70s, obviously, uh, that we don't need to do anything in the square. We'll just have a big open square, and people will be so impressed with our building, so in awe of it, that they will, I don't know, obey the, um, the overlords and uh, not make trouble. This is one of the worst public spaces on the planet. When you're very lucky to have one of the best examples of a small town's public space, uh, central public space, just down the road in, um, in Port Credit. I was really impressed to see they, um, I would call it an innovation. They said, Let's, the square isn't good enough on its own. Let's line the square edges with activity. Yes, even put housing above, uh, but make sure the ground floor is active so the square always has a sense of life in it. Anyway, just a bit of unsolicited advice. Um, okay, I want to talk about moving, how it feels to move through your town and through the surrounding communities. Uh, I'm just curious, who here absolutely loves to drive everywhere? Say, love it. Okay, there's four of you. That's surprising because almost everybody here drives almost everywhere. And uh, we, we know you do that uh, because you have to. You don't have much choice. So we're looking at, uh, a, in the um, morning commute, three quarters of people, uh, afternoon, almost everybody. But looking at these numbers, I thought, oh, this is kind of interesting because, you know, driving, people's self-reports of driving are kind of like that dead silence in this room when I asked you if you love driving to work. Here, here's me driving out from the airport yesterday. Whew. Um, so we know people are reporting that uh, their commute is one of the stress, most stressful periods of their day. Driving in traffic, you feel the same level of, of stress as a fighter jet pilot. We know that people in their cars are reporting the lowest levels, or excuse me, the highest levels of rudeness and incivility of any city dwellers. We're just mean to each other in our cars, even when we're nice people. 
So why do we put up with this? This strikes me as, as very odd because if you ask commuters how they feel about their commutes in general, one group of commuters says they are much happier than the rest. People who cycle and also people who walk are reporting higher levels of joy and lower levels of fear, rage, and sadness than people who move in any other way. This is a curious thing to me uh, because so few people are doing it here. What, 2% of people are doing it on their commutes here. But you have an opportunity. One in six com commuters in Milton is a car passenger. I think that's in, in the, both morning and in the afternoon. Um, but they're actually not going very far. So uh, I'm not going to ask you this because I already have the number here for you. Um, the average Milton passenger, so this is like 15% of your commuters, is only going like 2.9 kilometers, which is about a 10-minute bike ride. So most journeys in most towns are not commutes. There are people picking up groceries, running errands, and taking kids places, and taking other people who can't drive places. What if we could replace some of those? Then you are relieving so much of your traffic congestion. If only we could find a smart city solution to relieving congestion. You know, I've thought about this, and I came up with one. It's called a bicycle. And funny thing is, I'm not that original, because 60% of people in cities say they would like to try biking through their city, but they're concerned, they're scared, because they would do it here, but only about three to five percent would do it in a ridiculous like, environment like this in Florida. Or this stupid, this is the world's shortest bike lane, it's in Dallas. Way to go, Dallas. Um, yeah, whew. Uh, or, okay, let's just laugh at uh, Windsor then. This is a, a bike lane in Windsor. Uh, if you, uh, let's just turn this around. Now, if you would like to bike on this bike line, say, totally. You are one of the one to three to five percent. Congratulations. Very scary. Okay, so now we're in Milton. You're doing the same thing. So this is first generation bike infrastructure. And what we've realized is it works for um, very fearless, brave, uh, typically men between the ages of 20 and, and 38 until you wreck your knee like I did. And then it just becomes too scary. So if you want to get your numbers up to relieve congestion on most of your road network, you need to provide safe, separated bike infrastructure. And you don't have to spend the big money to do it. The best way to keep cyclists safe is to use these big metal objects to keep them safe, parked cars. And this is happening around the world, and uh, cyclist numbers are shooting up in cities where they're doing it, and it relieves congestion in the rest of the city. Um, yes, it snows here. In uh, Ottawa, they are building the bike infrastructure and they're blowing snow off it first. Uh, and we know if you do that, you know, then you start to hit your numbers, like in a city like Copenhagen, where 60% of people are now biking now, in some of the worst weather in the world. And you know, for those of you who, who are thinking, well, I'm never gonna try that, fine, but what if 10% of your population did it? What if other people did the biking? Your uh, congestion, we know you just need to deal with 3% congestion to really relieve uh, some of those pinch points. So what you, you want to aim for those uh, moderate numbers of cyclists to relieve space on the roads for everyone else. Um, but when it comes to, hi, I was just going to talk about walking, and I see someone's already taking a walk down here in front. So uh, we know that one of the best things we can do for our happiness in any moment is just to take a little bit of walk. You know, no problem, they say, is too great that you can't just walk away from it. And we know that people, after a short walk, are reporting being happier, getting healthier, and they have even higher self-esteem. They feel better about their lives. We spend so much money going to Florida or California to Disneyland and Disney World just to have the pleasure of walking in an environment where our kids won't get hit by cars on Main Street USA. So it's remarkable that um, we're not necessarily spending so much money building walkable environments here. So, okay. Uh, how does it feel to walk through our cities, particularly cities that are car-oriented? Again, back at the Guggenheim, uh, there was uh, Colin Ellert again with his skin conductance monitors. Remember, these measure arousal. You combine arousal with fear or low happiness, and you get stress, pure stress. So we wanted to see how it felt to walk across this, uh, which is a big, scary street, but it's not much compared to some of your avenues here. How does it feel to walk across this street? Now, look at this. You may not... Whoa. You may not be surprised. Does this have a pointer? Okay, I'll just jump up. See these mountains here? These are mountains of stress while crossing the street. What's interesting to me is this. These foothills. This is when people were standing on the edge of the street just thinking about walking across the street. 
And what this tells us is that for people with fear or with mobility challenges or if they're older and moving more slowly or their kids or whatever, they're not even going to cross the street and they've just lost access to half the city. So, you know, here we are back in Milton. I was just snapping pictures as we drove along today and many of your um, wider boulevards, I, I, w I was just terrified to cross and I tried it um, just before this talk tonight. So if I'm scared, you know, just think about people who are moving more slowly than me. Um, too often cities really have been planned by middle-aged guys for middle-aged guys. Um, we know that speed on roads kills. So it's not the cars that kill, it's the speed of those cars moving. So how can we, what can we do with those environments? Well, first of all, we can create zones where vehicles are moving more slowly. And this is a movement that's happening around the world. But the problem is, just telling people to move slowly doesn't actually accomplish the behavior change. We respond to design as drivers. So we want people to drive more slowly to create safer spaces for people. We actually have to redesign our roads. So this Vision Zero mov movement, the movement that says no pedestrian should ever be hurt or die in front of a vehicle, is primarily a design movement. So what's remarkable to me is that when we take these spaces and pinch them down to make them pedestrian friendly and safe, we're also creating more social spaces. <coughs> Excuse me. So Broadway in New York was famously transformed from a pretty horrific car sewer into one of America's greatest public spaces. And uh, what's interesting is the traffic is moving more smoothly from uptown to downtown because of the, um, the lower degree of tangle in that bizarre intersection. Uh, more um, sophisticated cities are going even further, experimenting with slow zones where sometimes cars are moving amongst people, but they're designed in such a way that slow those vehicles down. This is something you can have. And you know, it's funny, it's something you kind of did have at one time on your main street here. Your main street was a slow street 80, 90 years ago, and that changed. Um, just looking for my water. I'll be right back. Um, and that changed. Uh, in, at some point, your engineers made it a faster street again. So I tried to cross the street, and I found this sign. And I'm like, wait a second. I'm on the street corner. This is where I cross, right? And my friends were like, oh, no. Um, that, that was, you know, a couple years ago. You can't do that anymore. Um, so uh, because of some arcane rule at the regional or provincial level, all of a sudden, we lose our, our crossing here. And in fact, we're in an era where... Uh, towns and communities and cities are reclaiming these spaces and reclaiming these crossings. So I urge you to go to battle against the bureaucrats at the senior level, at the province or wherever, and the engineers who, not all engineers, but some engineers who, who prioritize vehicle speed over pedestrian safety. Um, this is what needs to be happening and is happening in small towns around the world, and it's revitalizing their main streets. So, uh, uh, yeah, let's build these places for everyone. Okay, I want to show you a vision of the future. Just yesterday, it was reported that in Tempe, Arizona, now Arizona is the most car-dependent region on the planet. Now in Tempe, Arizona, developers are creating a community for 1,000 people, and it's car-free. Not a single car allowed into the community, and you're not allowed to move there if you own a car. You have to sign a contract. And why is this possible? Why is it possible that there's so much demand for this kind of place? Well, partly because they built it near transit <coughs> and shops and services. Partly because we're now entering an era where mobility is supplemented with uh, micro-mobility, e-scooters, Uber, um, uh, and uh, e-bicycles. So all these options are there. It's all happening now and it's happening swiftly. And I encourage you to integrate this kind of thinking into the places you're building because it's these kinds of places that give people face time with each other. It's these kinds of places where people who are not like each other bump into each other in public. It's these kinds of places where children are healthier. It's these kinds of places that are actually generating better economic activity and lower costs for cities. And so this is the last argument I wanna make to you is this, in a world of complexity, and we do live in a complex world, and, and our communities and urban design is a, is a matter of complexity itself. Everything is connected to everything else. So everything you do to build a happier, healthier place is also good for your community's bottom line. Some examples. 
First of all, uh, Smart Growth studied why 200 companies in the U.S. moved. Big, big companies were moving. Turns out that each of these companies were moving to attract millennials, and they all moved to zones where it was more walkable, tight street grid, more connectable, slower streets, <clears throat> better transit, and better bike network. So companies want millennials. You're going to lose your youth population if you don't offer them these kinds of wonderful places to live and work. Second of all, uh, take a look at the uh, price difference. Now, these are in American dollars because they've made the worst mistakes over the last century. The cost, the, the city annual cost per household is double when you're building dispersal because things are just so far away. More tubes, more pipes, more wires, more roads, and then you have to maintain them later. 2008, dozens of American communities went bankrupt because they ignored this calculation. It's wonderful that Milton is looking at creating more connected, walkable, dense nodes to avoid the scenario on the left. Um, I'm gonna skip this, ask about uh, Joe Minicazzi's work later, okay? It's very exciting. Um, more tax revenue. Um, in the Peel region next door, the public health officers put out a groundbreaking report uh, two or three years ago that is now uh, creating a global movement of he uh, public health practitioners begging cities to make more walkable, connected places because it has an immediate impact on, um, on healthcare costs, diabetes, uh, heart disease, etc. So listen to your health professionals if you want to pay lower, uh, lower taxes for healthcare in the future. And finally, if you build these connected places, they will accomplish these things while also nurturing the relationships that are so important to all of us. And when speaking of relationships, I want to end by going back to that little experiment we did at the start of my talk with you tonight. Remember, you all had a trust-building encounter with a complete stranger, I hope. And it was kind of fun, and most of you said, yeah I, yeah, I feel a little better, that was great. And I said, well, there's something else that happened in this moment to you. I want to share that with you right now. So we've done this experiment in communities around the world, small towns, big cities. And we change it up a little bit. So in places like Guatemala City, in New York, in Querétaro, in Mexico, we divide the room in half. Half the room does the experiment, meeting a stranger. The other half of the room just has to sit there and do nothing and look at their phone. They don't really like it that much. And then at the end of the experiment, everybody reaches under their seat and pulls out the survey question. And this is the standard social trust survey for psychologists. If you dropped your wallet or your purse somewhere out in the city today, what are the chances you'd get it back if a stranger found it? So this is a proxy for social trust, but it also correlates with happiness. Now the amazing thing is when we do this, the people who participate, the people who have that brief trust building moment, their trust in strangers, not just the people they met, not just the people in the room, but everybody in the city shoots up. They care more and they trust other people more. And when you think about it, this is exactly the kind of attitude shift we need if we're going to, cha to take on the challenges of this age. Poverty, inequity, climate change, population growth, low trust between groups of people. We see what's happening south of the border. We can't tackle these problems if, as our communities, we are isolated, disconnected, and indifferent. We have to come together. We have to trust. Now, I'm not saying you all should go out and start hugging strangers. I'm happy to give you a hug after the show if you want tonight. But... I am saying we have a mountain of evidence that says the kinds of communities we build can either push us apart or draw us together. They can bring out the worst in us or they can bring out the best in us. They can help us see the best in each other. So you have this tremendous opportunity tonight and moving forward to think of ways to design your community that draw you together, that create more opportunities for more kinds of people that help you meet to face to face and help you see the best in each other. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your ideas on how you're going to do that. And I'm grateful for the chance to speak to you tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Charles. And I have to say thank you very much for spending like three or four hours with Jill and David and I driving around Milton today. And what was really important for me was to show you the past, the present, and the future of Milton. And something that sticks out is uh, you said, our downtown is a treasure. It's a treasure. It's something that uh, we need to preserve and we need to keep. And I also loved, <laughs> and I also really loved a lot of the comments that you said about some of our new developments, which are, um, which are facilitating social interaction and just uh, facilitating communities and we have and when we talk about the future we also have a lot of plans um, to create complete communities and to do something not different but like the same as what we were doing a um, hundred years ago in Milton so thank you for this presentation and thank you for driving around with us uh, and and letting us show you our community and what we're very proud of Thank, Thank you. you. Look forward to the workshop. Thank you. Before we do that, uh, we have about, oh, well, we have some time for three or four questions So, uh, from the audience. So does anyone have any questions for Charles? Let's take advantage of them while we have them. So <laughs> please let me know if you have any questions. We can't see anybody else. No, there I right can't now. see. There's an arm. There's I a, hope we have questions. Arm Do you see an back. arm? <laughs> Could we light up the audience a bit, please? Thank you. There we go. Thank you. Hi. Thank you very much for your presentation tonight. It was very informative. I'm wondering what you think about the trend we're seeing. Um, it's happening now in Milton. It happened a lot in Oakville, where older, smaller homes are being replaced with monster homes of approximately 25 to 3,000 square feet. I was told somebody was going to ask that. So I, get, I have two thoughts. Uh, one is a, a thought about aesthetics. My understanding is um, aesthetics here, the feel of a neighborhood and kind of continuity, is really important to, to many people here, or, or, or at least people who express themselves on the issue. So um, I think this is something that can be solved uh, through um, through um, linking up your design guidelines and some of your zoning regulations. But I also want to ask, um, how many people are living in these new homes? Um, is there a way to nurture and protect the heritage of your special neighborhoods while making room for more people? Because when many of your central neighborhoods were built, household sizes were double what they are now. So here you have a form. Uh, there's a danger that this form will be like stuck in time, like like an amber, while having fewer people, which is very dangerous. It means I mean I understand you don't have a gro grocery store downtown anymore. So how can you add more people to this environment in a way that's uh, that's uh, human scale and respectful? So I, I'm not. That's not a, really an answer to your question, but more a segue from it. So number one, you can solve that by linking your zoning regulations uh, with your design guidelines because your design guidelines are softer. But number two, I would encourage you while you're doing that to think, well, geez, how can that beautiful old home maybe have a couple of ex a couple or three accessory dwelling units tucked in behind that uh, suit the character? Thanks. Uh, yeah, sure. Oh, this is cool. Okay. All right, I see. Um, in your model examples of your, what I would call medium density community, um, am, am I using the right term? Say mid density communities as opposed to single dwelling homes. And I, some of the pictures projected showed apartments and what I would call townhomes or low rise housing. At what point do you feel that a community is being oversaturated with humanity in the height of a building and the number of apartments that it becomes actually a negative impact instead of a positive impact? Yeah. 
I think people think that's a great question. But I think they're embedded in your question was um, a concern, and that's why people are, are clapping along with you. <sighs> my answer is about four hours long. So um, my team and I have, ha have studied um, multifamily housing, well-being in multifamily housing. We've studied public space, and we also look at, at, at systems. And so the answer is, is a little bit complex, but I would say, first of all, when it comes to multifamily housing, um, what we're seeing is that when people are gathered in smaller social clusters, it's the most conducive to building neighborliness and trust and local relationships. That doesn't mean we need to ban towers. It does mean, though, if you're building a tower, you need to find ways to build those clusters within the tower environment, and towers need to work harder to invest back in the public realm. Um, my city does it pretty well. Uh, uh, by having a very high quality public realm and cozy living room like street edges and then thinner towers um, placed uh, in behind. Um, so you said at what point, is there like a cutoff point? I, I can't tell you a cutoff point, but what I can tell you is in this world of tremendous demand for housing, um, where are people gonna live? If they are not, if we don't make room for them, and this is really a Vancouver example now because I don't know your dynamics here. We decided in Vancouver, in our neighborhood associations, to ban the missing middle. In other words, to ban some townhouses, row houses, you know, up to four stories. People don't want it. So now we have a forest of towers downtown because people need somewhere to live. So those towers are a result of those neighborhood bans of m missing middle density. I think your dynamics here are quite different. And you don't have a mountain li limiting your growth and development. I, I would uh, caution you, though, I mean, maybe I said it earlier, that the people are coming. And what I do know is that new neighbors living close to transit and service will make my life easier by giving me somewhere to walk to and by supporting frequent transit, whereas new neighbors who live out on the edge they're going to make my life miserable because they're going to be adding to those six to seven trips a day made by local people in Milton. Um, so uh, I'm not giving you an opinion on form uh, because the form question is, is more complex. But I invite you to look at our website. We, have a, we created a tool called the Happy Homes Toolkit, um, and it essentially brings evidence and design together. It's free, free stuff to use as you wish. Um, I hope that was useful. So. I'm not the boss of who's uh, getting to ask questions. Oh, we're here. Okay. Hi. Um, I, I work in the uh, Toronto, downtown Toronto. Uh, okay. I commute on a daily basis um, because I work in the financial industry. Um, so in your research uh, in other cities, like, how do you help like, um, someone like me who commutes to another city for a job? Uh, what have you seen in your, you know, in some of the models of the city to support intercity, I guess, tra uh, transport? Okay, yeah, so you're commuting between uh, a smaller city to a bigger city to a job base in the bigger city. That's correct. Mm. My understanding is uh, here in Milton, you're at the end of the line, you're at the end of the rail line. That's correct. So it's hard for you to make the case for more rail service uh, unless you are able to um, guarantee bums in seats on those rail lines. So it really does mean um, creating a critical mass of jobs and housing near those stations. And my advice, I think you were looking for a policy advice for cities, and I would say create that critical mass. Um, and here's what happens if you don't. In um, Dallas, I believe, they invested billions of dollars into a new light rail system. It was beautiful. And the light rail system was complemented by park and ride stations with nothing around them their total transit ridership fell because they spent so much money on the rail, they had nothing left over for buses, and, um, and it was just inconvenient for everyone. So again, you need, to be, you need to be combining your land use with your transit plans, and a good land use plan is in fact your good transit plan. And it, my advice to you is, I, I would want to live near those nodes. Um, uh, you know, buy a house uh, seven minute walk away from the node. Is the microphone working? There you go. Okay. As someone who's grown up in the suburbs, uh, never having lived in the city, though we bump into less people, it feels like those relationships 
are more meaningful with those people. Whereas like any time I've gone to the city, you bump into more people, but it's kind of just uh, you're going to meet this person once and you're probably not going to see him again for, for a while. Whereas in the suburb, you know, you're dealing with the people on a more daily basis. You're bumping into the, into the same people. Yes. And the second part, sorry, is related to the, uh, the happiness index that you had. Um, I'm sure that in that community centers probably played a huge role in that. Um, also with regards to spiritual centers there, uh, what role does that play and how much should cities and towns be investing in that? Okay, I think there are uh, three questions here and I'm gonna start yeah. with your last question and then you can remind me of the first two. Um, uh, so there is a strong relationship between um, life satisfaction and participation in spiritual religious community. Uh, interestingly, the data shows, um, and, and this is may, you may find this a bit superficial, the data shows the, the strength of your belief is not as, Im as important as, the, um, as how often you actually show up. So showing up really matters. Um, now, of course, we could talk about all kinds of philosophical issues, but from a life satisfaction point of view, there, there's the, the data point. Um, we know that spiritual centers, so be it a, a mosque or, or a church or whatever, these can uh, create a focal point for the community that draw people together. And I think mosques in particular, if, if, you, if you know the tradition of mosques in the Middle East, for example, mosques can be fantastic nodes for shops and services as well. Lots can happen in those zones. And so they can be a tremendous community node. And I would say that um, the smaller the better. So like, segueing to your second question, I think you talked about community centers and whatnot and, um, and the scale at which people meet. So yes, when you go to the city and meet thousands of people, you don't connect. You can't remember all those names. Connection really depends on frequency of contact and size of social scale. So um, uh, I would say, whether it's in the big city or in a small town like Milton, the more you can nurture very local uh, whether it's spiritual or cultural or activity nodes, the better, both on a, on a personal basis but also on a community basis. Um, I heard that in, in Milton, um, the Muslim community has, has yet to find space for a mosque. And I would think the city needs to be doing everything possible to be finding that central space, but make sure it's in a walkable, connected neighborhood. Could you yell into the box? I think you have a microphone oh. beside you, do you not? No, okay. Could you stand and yell though? I think you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. So we are living, we're living in environments in modern cities, and, I, and again, I don't know the specific situation in Milton, but typically, large-scale developers buy a large chunk of land, and under direction from the city, they develop that land. The simplest way to develop it is to develop uh, a certain home typology, give it a school, maybe retail at the edge. Um, I would think if you feel strongly about this, and I think all faith communities, but all social communities as well, should be advocating for leave holes in that plan for the community to fill with anything other than housing. Small holes throughout. <laughs> Great point. have another question. interpreter and she'll speak she's my voice anyway obviously I'm a deaf individual I wanted to ask a question 
terms of designing cities, what would you suggest for disabled individuals or deaf people? We have a very large deaf community in Milton, and I'm wondering what kind of design you would be able to suggest so it, it is seamless and universal. I'm glad you asked that question. You may have noticed that I'm not deaf. No, <laughs> true. So, th no, this is significant. I can tell you uh, what my organization and I do, which is step one. If you want to plan <laughs> for people with disabilities, you have to include people with disabilities in the planning process. You must be in the room. So uh, an example of stupidity, uh, my team and I did an audit of um, human well-being in parks in Mexico City because they did changes to the parks. They fixed these places. And we went in and we're like, whoa, this is great, you know, marching around. That's such a wonderful park. I love it. And then we worked with a team of people with disabilities. <laughs> you know, first of all, the woman in the wheelchair couldn't even get in the park. Second of all, the guy with uh, another movement disability, a fatigue disability, couldn't go more than 100 meters because he needed to sit down every 100 meters. Uh, a woman who was blind, first thing she did was smash her head. So obviously, I feel some shame for my, no, is it shame the right word? For my past behavior, but also we learn from these people. And so I think um, if there could be a disability advisory committee for your planning and design department, this could be very helpful. Um, but these people should be paid. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can we? Hi. Is the microphone on? Try it again, Melissa. Hello. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. Very inspiring. Uh, my question is related to um, connecting rural communities. So Milton has a huge rural area. It has a, a large natural heritage system, a lot of conservation uh, areas. And I, I'm not sure if in your research you've um, had come up with something like that and how to connect and enhance those areas so that they're valuable for the community. It's a great question. So uh, what we do know, and uh, I actually didn't infuse my presentation with this, the contact with nature, contact with the natural world is a tremendous uh, um, generator of well-being. It's good for children in school. It brings down our stress. It helps us think. But it also, remarkably, I think, um, nurtures kinder behavior. People who live in contact with nature happen to be kinder to their neighbors and express more altruism about their life goals in the future. So. Um, I think, number one, protect those belts. Um, do all you can to protect them uh, to stop more people living in those places. Number two, connect those areas with uh, very robust trail systems that can come in and out of populated areas. Because the more people connect with nature, the more they want to connect, uh, uh, take care of those places. I also understand that you have um, uh, rural farming communities here. And, and these are folks who need access to the city. And I think, you know, once again, ensuring that we don't have further population growth in these greener zones will ensure that folks who do live in a green, green zones and need access to the city can still make those journeys and it doesn't just drive them crazy. So I think it, it needs to go both ways. Thank you. Thanks. Go ahead. Uh, in your presentation, I uh, I saw that you can show the people uh, somebody is looking for a map and go ahead and there are, so this is the history of the f 20 years ago. Now is uh, everybody is uh, internet and they can go for Google, and you sh saw all the connected communities, each other parking, uh, parking and shopping, and casinos, but how is the new uh, in the city of the new building city like Milton, how's the good, uh, these universities and colleges, uh, how they are good for the com uh, community, how they are connected with the so so society. And if there's a, in the city, if there's a university inside the city, so they, they don't need to go for the uh, extra transportation, extra time, how much the safe, and how the, um, the, the, the family are connected with their kids. 
and the more growth are coming. So you na in your whole presentation, I never see about the universities and uh, colleges and how they are connected. I don't see anything in your presentation, what you say about that, and how we can grow this thing in, in our Milton city. Yeah, it's a, such an, an important point. I'm glad you're giving me a, a chance to address it. My understanding is one of the biggest challenges in Milton is that uh, many people need to leave for work and school and uh, that one of the solutions uh, that you're all looking at and working on is bringing more work and more educational institutions here to the city. It's crucial. But I would say it's also important that those places are, are deeply connected with the, with the rest of the city. So <clears throat> um, I, I know you have uh, 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 future planning and development areas, the educational village on one edge, is it also the Tra Trafalgar Corridor on the other side? And um, uh, if you're going to develop those places, you need to do everything you can to, uh, uh, to accomplish the jobs and human density within those spaces that is going to support the transit and the safe routes that connect you with the rest of the city. If, the, if you build disconnected places, you're going to make life difficult for the people there, but also the people who are already living here. You don't need more people in cars in this community. I would say also, um, and I promise you, you will do this eventually, even if you don't do it now. Those institutions may also want to be looking at having bases within the current connected community. So we uh, built a university on a mountaintop near Vancouver, SFU. It's fine, it's pretty, completely disconnected from the rest of the city. They've now moved a third of their programming to downtown so people can connect with the life of the city while they're uh, getting educated and they have better uh, access to transit. So I imagine that's something that will happen. Uh, if you don't do it immediately, you'll probably do it later, but why not do it uh, immediately so you're connecting those institutions in and out? Great question, thank you. Okay, I'm a bit of a softie, so I'm gonna let you have. <laughs> Could you pass the microphone on? Yeah, but you have. Okay, well, you yeah. have to go to the workshop after, right? You do. Because right? <laughs> that's. I'm just gonna take these ideas and write them to my mom when I go home. It, you're. You must contribute these ideas during the workshop after if you want them heard. Okay, so one last question. I believe this is the time what we have allocated. So uh, in your happy city, what I have I have missed out is parks and. Uh, and grounds based on the Milton community, which has been growing now, and average age of Milton families is 34, 35 years of age. So what is your happy city recommend based on parks and grounds, how many parks you should have as part of the community which you are recommending? Wow, um, it's, it's an important consideration and I cannot give you an algorithm to solve that problem. <laughs> what I can tell you is that, is this. Um, so as I mentioned, we know that access to green space is very important. But when we worked in a city like New York City, and I asked people if Central Park was important to them, they all said, yes, very, very, very important. And I said, well, who's been to Central Park this week? Nobody had, out of hundreds of visitors to our lab. So what that reminded me was that we need to weave the natural experience through the course of every day. That means don't just think about giant parks, but also think about small parks, and also think of your streets, roads, avenues as park spaces so they can be enjoyed and, and activated like like park spaces yeah i think that's um that's essential thank you thank you that that wraps up our question and answer period before we move to the cafeteria to um, undertake our visioning workshop, I have a few things to say. I would just like to obviously thank Charles for coming here tonight, for spending the morning with us, for looking at Milton, for sharing his insights and his ideas. And um, yeah, we appreciate your, your time. Oh, we're gonna hug, <laughs> we're gonna hug. Thanks, Nancy. <laughs> I would also like to say that everyone in this room came here because you have something to say. So please do not leave without saying that, without sharing it. That's why we're here. This is visioning night. Um, so I would like to welcome everyone to take your time and move into the cafeteria. We have some questions for you. Um, we want more of your input. And, and, and Charles has done an amazing job of providing the inspiration and 
Now let's talk. Let's have a discussion as a community. On that note, please take your time, be safe, and if you could make your way onto the, uh, into the cafeteria for a workshop, that'd be much appreciated. We also have the concert band to come uh, again and escort you out with some music. Thank you very much, everybody.